Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Barncard. I'm a science writer here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you're in Madison like me, you occupy the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk Nation, and I invite you to reflect on the acts of displacement and migration that have brought us together today and to focus on our shared future of collaboration and education. Now we're here for our, uh, our Science Writer in Residence program today, which is deep into its third decade and one of our favorite parts of each semester. And I'd like to thank the University Communications Office for its support in this, and also the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Sharon Dunwoody, a professor emerita and scholar of science journalism and communication, has been our faculty guide for most, uh, maybe all, of the uh, writer in residence program, and we can't thank her enough for all the great work she's done, making sure excellent journalists get to share their experiences with uh, students and staff on campus and to experience the Union Terrace each spring and fall. Uh, Sharon has done plenty, though, and finally gets to experience something resembling retirement. Two great journalism faculty associates have stepped in to help keep our, our writer in residence program going. And I'd like to thank Stacy Forster and Pat Hastings for their help this semester and pretty much into perpetuity if they're following in Sharon's footsteps. Thanks to everyone. Uh, let's get to the fun part. I'm honored to introduce Michelle Nyehaus, author and longtime magazine writer and editor, NUW Madison Spring 2021 Science Writer in Residence. Michelle has made uh, several virtual visits to campus over the last few weeks to speak to journalism and life science communications classes and work with students. Uh, Michelle uh, is a self-described lapsed biologist who specializes in stories about conservation and global change. She just published in March a brand new book, Beloved Beasts, Fighting for Life in an Age of Extinction, that I'd encourage everyone watching to check out. There's plenty of uh, local boy Aldo Leopold in there, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll hear about him in his talk today, too. Uh, as a project editor for The Atlantic, Nighthouse edits and has written for a series called Life Up Close. Her writing, which has been honored twice with tri uh, AAAS's Cavalry Science Journalism Awards and once with a Walter Sullivan Award for Excellence in Science Journalism, appears in National Geographic, the New York Times Magazine, and the New Yorker Online. And she's a longtime contributor, contributing editor pardon me, to High Country News. She's uh, written two books about science writing, uh, co-editing the Science Writer's Handbook, Everything You Need to Know to Pitch, Publish, and Prosper in the Digital Age, and writing the Science Writer's Essay Handbook, How to Craft Compelling True Stories in Any Medium. And Michelle once lived with her family off the grid in rural Colorado for 15 years. Thankfully, she's back on the grid and here to talk to us today about finding hope in conservation history. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully I will stay on the grid for this entire talk. Uh, be helpful. <laughs> and it's great to be with you, if only virtually. I've really enjoyed uh, visiting the classes over the past couple of weeks and a few weeks and getting to learn a little bit about what all of you are up to, both as students and as journalists, practitioners in the field. So I would like to talk to you this evening about um, a word that I think is on many of our minds these days, which is hope. And let me get my screen shared with you. Hopefully you can all see that. And um, my, the good news I have for you is that I, one of the unexpected results of um, immersing myself in the history of conservation for the past couple of years was was that I did gain a dose of hope, uh, though it's not quite what I think people are usually talking about when they ask whether or not I feel hopeful about the future. So I this talk is in a way a long answer to the question of whether or not I have hope and and what if so, what kind of hope. Um, and in order to, that answer involves telling you a couple of stories from my book and, and what they mean to me. Uh, but let me start first of all by uh, telling you a little bit about the book itself and by way of doing that, telling you a little bit about me. 
so this is me back in uh, 1996. I uh, I am holding, <laughs> well, the thing I am holding is a GPS antenna, which is one way you know it's 1996 because uh, I am, I'm working as an assistant on wild, a wildlife biology project and I'm using that antenna to uh, take a record of the exact locations of our study plots so we can find them again. Of course, anyone with a smartphone could do this now uh, with far less effort and probably more accurately uh, and more quickly. Uh, but I, so this is what I did after I graduated from college with a biology degree. I worked in um, a lot of out of the way places around the US Southwest, uh, helping out on wildlife research projects. And this took me up close to a lot of gorgeous landscapes and really amazing animals, but it also put me, um, gave me a front row seat, so to speak, to many of the very uh, passionate, even violent conflicts over endangered species that were taking place in the West at the time and continue to unfold around the world. And I was very struck by these arguments because, well, because for many reasons, but primarily because I was, I had been interested in environmentalism and conservation, and I was surprised that these arguments were about such basic questions. Why should we protect this species? Why does it matter? Whose responsibility is it? Should we even protect it? Um, why are you telling me to what to do uh, about this species? And as I became a journalist and and continued to write about conservation, it became clear to me that these there was just so little agreement over these very fundamental questions in conservation. And I had a sense that they had been answered by smart people in the past, but like many people interested in conservation, I really, I knew some famous names and knew a little bit about those individual people, but I didn't have a sense of the conservation movement as a movement of ideas that had built on each other over time. So. So starting in 1996, I started mulling over these questions, many moments of astonishment and curiosity, followed by uh, many years of, uh, of reporting um, on conservation and reporting on climate change and other related issues. And then I finally wrote a book. <laughs> and, um, it wasn't that easy. There was a lot that went on in the parentheses. Uh, and of course, trying to represent more or less the entire history of the conservation movement or the global conservation movement in a reasonably sized book was not an easy task, but it was also very rewarding in that it helped me put together some of the answers that people had come up with the, to those very profound questions that I heard people arguing about 25 years ago and, and still hear people arguing about all the time. So one of my more immediate reasons for writing the book was that was really my frustration with the state of conservation news coverage. And um, here's a, <laughs> I'm sure these headlines will seem somewhat familiar to you. This is a highly unscientific selection of headlines from the past month or so. Um, I feel that, uh, or what I observe in conservation coverage is that we as journalists are so dependent on extinction as a news hook. Um, that is what we depend on to provide us with the drama in conservation. And while, you know, to say that we need more than that is not to take away anything from the importance of these individual stories or these individual species, every extinction is a tragedy. And it is irreversible. I mean, there's a reason why we as journalists feel those stories are important and dramatic and want to tell them. But I mean, if there's anything I learned from my book project is that it's that or was reminded of, it's that conservation is about more than preventing extinction. And um, I think my hope was by going back in history and showing how conservation had in fact grown from a movement of protecting individual species into something much more than that, I could help to expand the conversation a little bit because I felt like the conversation as it stands in the, in the, the mainstream media is so limited to talking about whether or not we're going to save this or that usually charismatic, usually iconic, usually highly endangered species from extinction. Um, because what the conservation movement, I think it, to generalize has discovered over the past 150 years is that conservation is about protecting relationships. Um, 
among species, between species and habitats, and which most belatedly, which I'll talk about a little bit later, between humans and other species. So that said, uh, extinction really was, or the threat of extinction really was the impetus for the modern conservation movement. Um, it one of the things that struck me as I as I began research on this book was to to really grapple with the idea that or to to understand that we haven't as a society we haven't acknowledged the reality of extinction for very or the or our role our possible role in extinction for very long. Um, of course, humans have been driving bird species on isolated islands extinct for millennia. Uh, both prehistoric humans and then uh, European explorers and colonists as they reached the Pacific and Indian Oceans. But in Europe and the and uh, North America, people had this very strong sense that species had been created by God. These were categories that never changed, never appeared or disappeared. And that was the accepted uh, truth until uh, until the very end of the 1700s when scientists finally showed that species had gone extinct in the past, um, you know, that there had been species on earth that no longer existed. And then in the mid 1800s, when Darwin came out with the origin of, on the origin of species and showed everyone that species did in fact change over time, he also mentioned somewhat in passing that humans could be responsible for driving species extinct. And this idea really fired the Victorian imagination. And um, some people were completely fascinated by it, including an author named Lewis Carroll, <laughs> a name that probably is familiar to most of you. He, uh, he, really, he really could not let go of this idea of this, his fascination with the idea that uh, European sailors a couple centuries earlier had driven extinct this wild looking, ground nesting giant pigeon from an island in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the dodo had been extinct for so long that some people didn't even believe it existed anymore, but Lewis Carroll did and, and he believed in it so much that he turned himself into one. He made his own alter ego in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a giant talking dodo. And that's how the dodo became the symbol of extinction that we know today. So in the late 1800s, um, <clears throat> excuse me, people really came to terms with the fact that, yes, people could drive species extinct, even physically large, extremely abundant species. And the most famous example of that is the American bison, which was hunted commercially throughout the 1800s. And by the late 1800s was, was really, it was famously abundant throughout the North American plains and beyond. But by the late 1800s was down to just a few hundred animals. And when this became clear to people in urban North America, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some people entered a, a, a sort of a, a second stage of denial where they they said, well, that uh, that's very sad, but perhaps this is the price of progress that the, the bison has to go in order for the continent to be quote unquote civilized. And it, it took a few people, one of them being, um, William Temple Hornaday there in the uh, with the stick and the and the fancy suit um, to stand up and say, you know, it, yes, it's sad. No, it's not inevitable, and we have an obligation to do something about it. Um, William Temple Hornaday, ironically, was a trophy hunter, a taxidermist. Um, he was a complicated guy, as I'll talk about in a minute, and he did some things that may or may not have been that helpful to the bison. But one thing he did that we know was helpful was to actually raise bison um, in the Bronx. He became director of the Bronx Zoo. He uh, he had a series of <laughs> trial and error uh, errors uh, raising bison, but but after a couple of years, he had a, a thriving herd. He sent, he, uh, he put some of the bison on a train out to Oklahoma in 1907 and let them loose on the prairie where they flourished and uh, the herd grew and grew and is is the became the seed of most of the herds that we now have on public lands today. So we Hornaday was not the only savior of the bison, but had he not had 
done this audacious thing. I mean, species reintroductions were not something that people did or considered at the time. It was this was a this was a crazy idea of his. And had he not done it, we very well might not have the relatively healthy population of bison that we have on the continent today. So <laughs> this is Hornaday's friend, Teddy Roosevelt, future president, Teddy Roosevelt, all kitted out in his um, his frontier uh, garb, his mountain man garb. And he was, this picture was actually taken in New York, but he was living in South Dakota at the time, having a, having a kind of wilderness year away from politics. Uh, and as I write in my book, uh, the early conservation movement especially is full of people who did the right things for the wrong reasons or what we would now consider the wrong reasons. And Hornaday and Roosevelt and many of their colleagues um, genuinely loved the and appreciated and admired the bison, wanted it to survive. But their reasons were very, uh, their reasons were complex and, and not what we would consider that admirable today, at least in some ways. Uh, their admir they considered the bison, you know, were really a symbol of national pride. They wanted to save it because they were, they were, you know, it was proof to them of the of American superiority. They also believed that the bison was a symbol of, or or not a symbol, but so much as a a a, a tool for protecting white masculinity, which was thought to be threatened at the time by by the industrialization of the of urban America and by the fact that many young white men were employed in offices and were thought to be kind of fading away and, and desperately in need of some uh, red-blooded exercise on the frontier, which usually involved chasing after bison. So they thought by, by preserving the bison, they were preserving this frontier experience for the American man and therefore preserving some part of the national character. Um, and perhaps most perniciously, Hornaday especially was quite uh, oblivious or, or intentionally oblivious to the very real effects of the decline of the bison on the Native American tribes and First Nations who were just devastated culturally and economically by the decline of the bison, by the devastation of the bison. And in fact, there was a lot of, of course, evidence showing exactly the opposite even in his time, but Hornaday insisted that Native Americans were mostly responsible for the bison slaughter. So he he saved the bison in, in, you know, he did very concrete things on behalf of the bison, but <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's fair to say that his restoration <clears throat> was incomplete, um, not only because he was oblivious to the, the cultural effects of the, of the bison decline, but he was also uh, working at a time when the science of ecology was very young and he basically treated bison like cows. He shipped them out to the prairie, let them go. Uh, they survived, he was happy about that. He didn't have a sense of the, the bison as we know, know it today as a keystone species on the prairie that interacts with, a lots, of different, with lots of different species and, and has a real measurable effect on the overall health of the ecosystem. So, so Hornaday is a man of contradictions and ironies. And, but one of the things I love best about his story is the happy irony that has, uh, that has ha taken place since his death, about a century after his death. Uh, many of the tribes and First Nations who were most affected by the slaughter of the bison began to um, began to return bison to their, to tribal lands, often using uh, bison from the so-called Hornaday herds on public land. They would buy a few bison and then um, the herds have since grown. And there are now many of such herds. This is one on the Blackfeet Nation that has a very active bison, bison restoration program. And, and the idea with these herds is to, in a sense, finish the job that Hornaday started, to, to allow these bison to move more freely, to reconnect them with the cultures to whom they were so important and are still so important, and to really have a continent-wide restoration strategy led by the tribes. And to me, this is one of the most exciting things happening in conservation today, because it's they're working with a species that's not in crisis, that has a chance of being eco restored to its ecological role or something like its, e its original ecological role. It's, um, it's a restoration project that is culturally so significant as well as being ecologically significant. 
and um, and it's taking place over a huge area. So a lot of people are, will be able to witness it and benefit from it. A lot of a lot of landscapes will be able to benefit from it, and it has a lot of momentum, and it, it has including from the federal government, which has just issued a new bison plan that that um, really emphasizes uh, cooperation and support of these tribal led efforts. So, so at about the same time that Hornaday was working to protect the bison, activists, conservation activists were starting to work to protect birds, which were under threats, under threat for a number of reasons. Um, First of all, a bit unexpectedly, they were threatened by the people who loved them most, um, some of the people who loved them most, naturalists and scientists, because there, were, at this time in the late 1800s, there were no, uh, there were no cheap optics, no cheap binoculars. And so the best way to get a close look at a bird was to shoot it and, and in fact, shoot several of its kind and and then look at them closely and look how individuals varied between species and many naturalists and and scientists thought nothing of shooting dozens of birds at a time just to further their research and you know this was done and <laughs> naturalists and scientists have left behind records talking about their their inner conflict you know they truly loved these birds and and wanted to to know them in some way, and but at the same time, some they knew also knew that some of these birds were getting quite rare, and um, and they wrote in their journals about their their inner conflict at you know being un unable to resist taking just one more uh, Carolina parakeet, um, which unfortunately is now extinct. Someone who was very important in changing this was Florence Marion Bailey. Uh, she was just out of Smith College when she wrote the book Birds Through an Opera Glass. It was it was becoming at that time uh, in the 1890s, mid 1890s, it was becoming possible to uh, buy a uh, pair of opera glasses, as they, as they were called at the time, and go out on the weekends and get a really close look at birds without harming them. And so Florence Marion Bailey's book, her guide to birds, really Jump started the the pastime of bird watching. People realized it was something they could do on the weekends. It was really quite fun and didn't require a lot of skill. Certainly didn't require good aim <laughs> anymore. And um, and by doing that, she of course really strengthened the conservation movement. The Audubon Society became much stronger. Um, people just once they got to spend time with birds, once they got to look at them closely, they they appreciated how special they were and. Um, and that was a, a another part of the conservation movement that started to grow very quickly in the late 1800s. Um, I was just as a, a side note, I was really pleased to see in in 2019 that Florence Marion Bailey got her own belated but um, but very elegant and wonderful obituary in the New York Times as part of its series of um, of obituaries for people who were important but not memorial excuse me not memorialized at the time of their death in the Times. So another and even greater threat to birds at the time were these crazy hats. Um, <laughs> and, and birds have, of course, feathers have, of course, been used for decoration for thousands of years. Um, and But the fad for feathered hats at the end of the 19th century was especially damaging because fashion was democratizing at the time. Middle class women all of a sudden could buy, uh, you know, knockoffs of designer articles from mail order catalogs, which was in many ways a really cool thing, but but it had the effect of when designers started incorporating feathers into their hats, um, there, became, there was a huge uh, demand for more feathers to decorate more hats for many women of many classes to wear um, every day. So, and like most fads, this fad sort of built on itself and became more and more extreme. You can see this woman on the left is, uh, has almost an entire bird on her head. And then the, the woman on the right, or at least on my right, is um, is wearing what looks like a wicker laundry basket with like a, several giant feathers um, that are at least half as tall as she is. So this was, it's entertaining to look back on. And I really enjoyed looking at some of these, some of these uh, so hats because they didn't just have birds in them. Some of them had like taxidermied rodents and, you know, whole little forest scenes on them. But uh, they, of course, had a devastating effect on birds. These are egret chicks that were dying of starvation. This was part of a 
quite famous series of photos that caused a lot of um, a lot of uh, uproar when it was published because people hadn't you know hadn't seen firsthand what was happening when these adult birds were killed and their chicks were left to starve you know painfully over several days. Uh, here, hummingbird skins sold for two cents each. So you can tell, even adjusting for inflation, they they went pretty cheaply, and um, there were a whole lot of them. And they were sold at this uh, at this feather sale in London, um, you know, by the by the by the massive batch. So one of the round estimates is that at at the peak of the plume craze and the plume trade, five million birds were killed each year. Um, so the somewhat predictable reaction to this uh, by many people, including um, many male conservationists, was to blame the wearer of the hat. And there were a lot of cartoons like this showing women in fancy hats shooting birds or strangling birds or, or looking, you know, uh, looking like the villains of the piece. And um, William Hornaday, our friend from the, the bison story, actually published a, a kind of very scolding essay on the cover of the women's section of the New York Times. I, I don't think he had the great greatest uh, public relations advice. Someone should have told him that scolding your audience was maybe not the way, best way to change minds, but he wrote this essay called Women, Woman, the Juggernaut of the Bird World. And I love uh, Virginia Woolf's response to this, this position, which was to say, and I think her words are, you know, look, I, I have no sympathy for, the society woman who thinks that a, a lemon colored egret is the, the best addition to her evening dress. But let's remember the birds are killed by men, starved by men and tortured by men, not vicariously, but with their own hands. And what she could have added is that women were also at the forefront of the movement to protect these birds, to end the plume trade. And um, people like Florence William, Florence Marion Bailey, excuse me, and many others, um, many of, of whom got their training as activists in the suffrage movement. There's a lot of, there's a really interesting uh, interaction between those two movements. They they organized and fought really hard for legislation. And in 1918, after a couple of decades at least of work, they, they won the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which still stands today, despite attacks from the Trump administration, um, basically ended the plume trade in North America. And um, in 1921, the UK basically ended the market for feathers in the UK by passing the Importation of Plumage Prohibition Act, and that was followed by several similar laws in Europe. So um, immediately, in the years immediately after this, volunteer bird watchers in Florida and elsewhere where these, these highly um, sought after birds uh, had been, you know, their populations had been plummeting due to the plume trade. These volunteer bird watchers were able to document um, very quick increases in numbers because, of course, these birds were no longer being pursued or orphaned. And um, it was an early victory in the conservation movement and one that we still owe a lot to today. I mean, were it not for these laws, there are a lot of birds that we would only be able to see in in paintings um, and that we now often take for granted today. So any, you know, any bird with showy plumage was subject to, to the plume trade and, and was in danger of extinction in during these years. And it, it took people with foresight to fight hard to pass these laws um, that headed off uh, what would surely have been a, a real, uh, a, a huge contraction in our continents fauna and one we would we would look back at regretfully today I'm sure so once the uh, once the fight against the plume trade was won uh, the job was not over because the migratory bird treaty act did not fully it didn't include um, as I said in the last slide it didn't include game birds and it didn't include most birds of prey and at the time, the conservation movement was mostly still made up of sportsmen like William Hornaday and and then bird watchers who loved to watch beautiful birds. It, there wasn't a sense of we have to protect species for their own sake. Most people were cared about these species, but they cared about them because they liked them for whatever reason. They liked to hunt them or they thought they were beautiful or or useful in some way. And one person who thought differently was Rosalie Edge, and she's one of my favorite characters in my book. She's certainly not as well known as she should be. She was a 
a uh, wealthy Manhattanite who was active in the suffrage movement, didn't turn to birding until um, her 40s after the somewhat traumatic and sudden uh, breakup of her marriage. She she recovered from this personal loss by, by finding solace in birds. And she lived on the Upper East Side in Manhattan. She got to know the bird watchers who frequent Central Park. There's a very dedicated community of, of bird watchers who like to watch the, the the spring and fall migrations in the park. There still is, in fact. And as she got to know these these folks, they told her, well, you know, the Audubon Society is not doing a great job of protecting birds of prey. They're really not standing up for them. They, you know, a lot of the sportsmen who are in charge of the Audubon Society consider these birds pre pests or or competition for them because they like to hunt the same birds that that these that these birds of prey like to like to hunt. And uh, Rosalie Edge thought this was ridiculous, and she um, waited until the annual meeting of the National Association of Audubon Societies in 1929 and marched across Central Park in her uh, best suit and um, marched right into the American Museum of Natural History, where the annual meeting was taking, pla taking place. And she was by then a life member of the Audubon Society, and she stood up and said, look, you know, this is this is ridiculous. This is not what conservation should be about. It should be about protecting all species, not just the ones that you like. And and she had quite a bit of support among the membership. And so she she really um, she really sparked an, an uprising. And the the powerful leaders of the Audubon Society had to somewhat sheepishly back down and say, okay, okay, you know, after after being prodded uh, over time, over many months and years, to back down and say, okay, we, we will in fact, um, stand up for eagles, hawks, and owls. Uh, but they, these birds were still not protected by law in any way. And, and after Rosalie Edge launched this, this uh, internal battle within the Audubon Society, she then found out that there was this ridgeline in Pennsylvania where hunters would go uh, every year. It happened to be a place where topography and wind currents just carried a lot of migratory birds overhead. And the birds flew so close to this ridge top that the hunters could just pick them off by the dozen at, at very close range. And it was, this was this annual tradition again, because people thought that hawks and eagles were kind of pests or disposable animals and, or, um, you know, animals that threatened livestock, like that they would, they would uh, feed on chickens. So, so these local hunters were, were happy to get rid of them. And, uh, Rosalie Edge was horrified by this, so she rented and then bought the land that this ridgetop, uh, covering this ridgetop, and turned it into a place called Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, which stands today. And one of the most important things that she did as the founder of the sanctuary was to turn to the fellow in the white hat in this photograph, and who was the caretaker. He was a when Hawk Mountain Sanctuary started, he was a young naturalist from Boston, and. Um, his name was Maurice Brown. And she said to him, Maurice, I think it would be a good idea for you to start taking notes on the, the number and kind of, of birds that pass overhead during the migration seasons. And he dutifully did this and continued to do it for the many years that he remained at Hawk Mountain. I think the, the record is broken uh, for a couple of years where he was um, off fighting World War II. But other than that, it, it has remained continuous and it's the, the longest record of its kind in the world now. Um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary still exists today. You can go. I highly recommend it when you are on the East Coast. It's really exhilarating to be up there and see the birds fly overhead and sometimes even underneath you because they'll come, they fly around the edges of these promontories and um, at high speeds because they're being blown <laughs> by the prevailing winds. And it's really quite exciting. And um, these records, uh, which there are now many other raptor count sites in the world modeled modeled on Hawk Mountain. Um, but as I said, this was a particularly, it, it was the first record and it is the, still the longest one, became important in a way that Rosalie Edge probably never expected in 1960 uh, when a author named Rachel Carson, who I'm sure is a name, which I'm sure is a name you all know, uh, wrote to Maurice Brown. She had visited Hawk Mountain about 15 years earlier and remembered it. And, and she said, she wrote to Maurice and said, uh, I am writing a book about the effects of DDT on wildlife. And uh, I hear that you have seen a drop in the number of bald eagles and the number of eagles. 
at Hawk Mountain. And he wrote back and said, well, yes, we have. And, and we know that it's unusual because, you know, we've been taking this record since the early 1930s. We've been keeping this record since the early 1930s. And, and um, in the past few years, we, the numbers of young eagles have always been relatively steady, but in the past few years, we've seen this really sudden drop. And in fact, this past year, we didn't see any young eagles. And this became what Rachel Carson referred to as a very significant piece of, of data in her case against DDT um, in Silent Spring. And, and Silent Spring, I mean, we know now that DDT was thinning the eggshells of birds and, and was causing this very direct effect. You know, it was basically like cutting off the next generation of, of eagles and other birds. Um, but it wasn't clear at the time that there was a direct connection between DDT and these observed declines in wildlife. So Car Rachel Carson had to sort of build her case like a lawyer by accumulating case studies and evidence um, to show just through repetition that there must be a connection here. There must be uh, a pattern and DDT must be the common thread. And had she not had that piece from Maurice Brown, she might have had a much weaker case. It might have been much less convincing. And as it was, it took 10 years after Silent Spring, more than 10 years actually, to ban DDT. And so had it not been Ros for Rosalie Edge, had it not been for Maurice Brown, had it not been for the fact that Rachel Carson took a trip to Hawk Mountain and, and heard about what was going on there, uh, we might live in a very different world today. So there's one last person I want to talk about um, who I really loved getting to know through my book research. Um, I want to talk a, just briefly about her before I wrap up. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom <laughs> won the Nobel Prize in economics, but is still not as well known as she should be even in her field and certainly not in conservation, even though her work has such relevance to conservation. Um, she her her claim to fame, so to speak, was in disproving the or in challenging the theory of the tragedy of the commons. And I'm sure all of you have heard the tragedy of the commons as an as an expression that people use. It's still taught quite uncritically in environmental science classes, and you still hear people say it casually all the time. Um, but it it was a idea that was proposed by an ecologist uh, in the late 1960s named Garrett Hardin, and he wrote in the pages of Science w without really any data to support it. This was just a, a thought experiment of his. He said, you know, uh, my my guess is that when humans are are given access to a shared resource, unless it's fully controlled by government or unless it's fully privatized, if there's you know, if they have access to it and they know it's shared, individual humans will just take as much as they can until the resource is used up. And of course, you know, I think we all observe this, this phenomenon. It does happen. You know, we observe it in our daily lives every time we're stuck in a traffic jam that that people will, you know, take often take the resource as much resources as available to them. But what Eleanor Ostrom showed is that this is not inevitable in any way. And in fact, there are systems all over the world that people have devised over hundreds of years that have helped them share uh, resources like water and forest and wildlife um, quite peacefully and without privatizing the resource or without you know, resorting to some kind of totalitarian situation. And her, I, it's, I, I think that the, the persistence of the tragedy of the commons as a metaphor is one of the most um, or at least it's one of the most unnecessarily uh, uh, discouraging ideas in conservation because I was able to, to travel to Namibia. I won't talk much about this. I'll leave you to find out about it in the book, but I was able to travel to Namibia in the course of research for this book and visit one of these community-led conservation initiatives that was inspired in part by the ideas of Eleanor Ostrom. It's based on... Um, it's based on pre-colonial models of of local management, and the effort is to to revive those those systems to some extent and adapt them to the present day. and And it was so exciting for me to be there because there here was a case where people had been working to build this system, this community led system of conservation for more than thirty years. Um, they had had re had restored a level of local author of, of authority, the le local level of, of authority that had been missing um, from the conservation 
uh, the structure of conservation for many, many years. And these local community members were, uh, you know, went to a lot of trouble to attend their annual meeting to make sure that the community was doing what they thought was right in terms of providing for the long-term future of other species. And, and the rewards have been concrete, both for people and for, uh, and for many of the species they live alongside, including better control of poaching than in many other places in Africa and um, real success with elephant and rhino populations, which of course are threatened um, in other places on the continent. So that to me was just an, an encourage, it's, it's really the direction I think the conservation movement needs to go. Um, we do need parks and reserves, of course, but uh, we can't, that can't be our only tool if we want to accomplish conservation at a meaningful level or to, at a meaningful scale. We have to support people in living successfully alongside other species. And Eleanor Ostrom's work shows that that and has been done for many years. And I think part of the job of conservation is to continue to support that, continue to make it possible, continue to help people equitably share the costs of conserving the animals they live alongside, because there always are some costs. And, um, and then to also fairly share the benefits, the long-term benefits of conservation. And I think if we can do that, we can get beyond, to some extent, we can get beyond the politics that surround so much of endangered species conservation, especially, and get down to what I think is our basic agreement that we as a species do not want to see our the species we live alongside go extinct. I mean, you, if you could give everyone a truth serum, I'd like to think that if you ask them, do you really want to see that species that you've grown up with go extinct? people would say, well, it's, you know, it's annoying in some ways. I don't like the government policies around it, but, but no, I don't, I don't want to have a hand in making it disappear forever. And I, I think that's the level at which conservation, that's the agreement from where conservation can truly move forward. So getting back to my original question, where is this hope that we speak of? Um, these are some of the things that gave me something like hope in the course of this, these realizations documenting the, these, these developments over time gave me a lot of hope for conservation. Um, the fact that we have moved from protecting single species to protecting species of all kinds, even if the public perception is lags behind what conservation is actually doing. I think that realization is widespread within the conservation movement. Um, through conservation biology, which I know many of you are studying, um, we've learned a lot about what other species need to survive. I mean, we were way more sophisticated than William Hornaday was when he was you know, trucking uh, bison out to the prairie. We know what kind of habitat, how much habitat, how, you know, how fragmented or unfragmented it needs to be, what other species need to be beside it. We can be very, um, much, much, much more detailed in our in our actions, and much more effective in our in the actions we take to protect habitats and therefore protect relationships among species. Um, and then, as I talked about with Eleanor Ostrom, belatedly, I think the conservation movement is moving to this um, out. It's moving beyond parks and reserves as its only tools for conservation, and looking at how to support humans in living within ecosystems and alongside other species. And that to me, I think is one of the most encouraging uh, trends in conservation today. And it's also, I touched on this, I, I go into it much more in my book, but it's reckoning with the history of racism and colonialism that is quite pervasive in, in the history of conservation. And I don't want to imply that the practice of conservation is racist in any way, or that or that all conservation is a racist, that's certainly not anywhere near the truth, but in every generation, there have been people who have uh, confused their love for other species with, with some very, um, very pernicious ideas about their own species. Um, and, and to, you know, sometimes to disastrous effect. And I think that the conservation movement now is genuinely reckoning with that. And I think it's a good thing. I think that's it that needs to happen in order for the conservation movement to become more than a special interest, to become truly something that is not uh, not a niche 
concern, but a, an everyday practice uh, undertaken by people of all kinds and people of all walks of life. Uh, another realization that that was gave me something like hope, I'll call it, was that change takes time. Uh, as as I told you in my my stories about the early conservation movement, these many of these victories were hard won and and won slowly. And here are just a few examples of that. Um, a lot of people don't remember that it did, as I mentioned, it took a decade to ban DDT and, and Rachel Carson had passed away by that point and it, it depended, the banning of DDT was really brought about by grassroots activists who were, you know, had very little experience and very little funding, but brought lawsuits all over the country and, and eventually persuaded the Environmental Protection Agency to ban DDT. Um, the bald eagle, Again, not to imply that that uh, conservation is about iconic species, but the bald eagle really is a, an amazing example of conservation is working over generations to protect a species from multiple threats and to bring it back to true abundance. Um, I'm always struck by the fact that I never saw a bald eagle when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s on the East Coast. I, you know, I saw them on the back of a coin and that was it. And they're so common where I live in Washington state now that when I point them out to my daughter, she is like, oh yeah, that, that's nice mom. You know, I've seen, I've seen a million of them and I still get pretty excited about them because I know the story, but to have them be boring <laughs> to a younger generation, I think is quite an accomplishment. Um, and that said, you know, we, we do have, uh, one thing I do worry about is I don't worry about our potential to accomplish conservation on a meaningful level, but I do worry about it's our potential to accomplish it uh, in time, <laughs> in in the time that we need to accomplish it before uh, many of the species that we know and love uh, fall prey to other threats. Um, and I think oddly, uh, ironically, many people who think about climate change and about conservation took a strange kind of hope in the in the speed at which the world responded to the coronavirus pandemic um, in early 2020. Of course, there are many, a million problems with that response um, and the tragedies are ongoing, but the fact that people were all over the world were able to change their behavior in quite radical ways in the space of a few weeks, I think made a lot of people working on climate issues and conservation issues think, okay, now we know, we know it's possible. Um, we don't know how to bring it about yet, but we do know it's possible. And that's something that we weren't sure of before. So I think the kind of hope that I found in the conservation movement and in the history of the conservation movement is in uncertainty. We don't know the end of the story. The tragedy of the commons is not inevitable. We shouldn't presume to know the end of the story. Um, it's, I think it, there's a sort of pervasive uh, apocalypse narrative in our society today. And I think it's really important for us to push back against that and say, look, you know, <laughs> yes, there's a lot of things that that seem pretty dark right now, but there were a lot of things that seemed pretty dark in World War II or in the Dust Bowl when Aldo Leopold was doing some of his most important work. And and it, these er, these conservationists who came before us continued to work, even though you know if they had had to place bets on the end of the story, they might have they might have you know bet against <laughs> conservation making progress. And I think it also hope, or my kind of hope at least lies in possibility and knowing that these things are possible, that that people can live productively alongside other species, that they can have the foresight to do what's right by the species that they live alongside or that they know that their, their descendants will depend on. Um, and so I think what I what I mean when I say hope is is not exactly what people mean when they ask me about it because I don't think we kind I don't think we get the kind of hope where we can be sure that we're going to get to witness the uh, the benefits of our work. Most of the people I wrote about had died without knowing that what they had done was the success that it turned out to be. Um, some of them became well known in their lifetimes, many of them did not. Um, and so I think maybe it's resolve that we're looking for, a sense of resolve a set combined with a sense of possibility and a sense that the story is not over, that it continues. Um, and so when I do feel badly, when I like the summer, when I you know looked out the window and was trapped in my house, not only by the pandemic, but <laughs> by wildfire smoke that was it's so dense that we literally could not walk outside. Um, I take refuge in uh, your hometown guy, Aldo Leopold, 
who was a very optimistic person in many ways, but wrote to a friend during an especially grim time, a comment that has, oh, has stayed with me for many years. And he said that the situation is hopeless, should not prevent us from doing our best. So thank you. I don't think the situation is hopeless. And um, I do hope that all of us will continue to do what seems like to us to be the best. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Michelle. I, uh, there's a, a photo hanging in the hallway at the Arboretum here uh, in UW-Madison uh, that I used to walk by all the time with Leopold and a couple of his graduate students standing mm -hmm. in this blackened swath of ground that they had just burned in you know one of their earliest prairie restorations. And nobody's dressed for the occasion. They have these <laughs> sticks with burlap sacks to beat out the fire and clearly you know, there were smoke and flames and ash all over the place, but Leopold is wearing white pants in that picture. And that's, <laughs> that's the kind of optimism I like to take away from every visit to the Arboretum. So, Talk about uh, hope, man. <laughs> guy, he found a silver lining and lining in some hopeless circumstances. That, that's for he sure. sure did. Yep. We do have some great questions uh, from, uh, from people who are watching your talk. Uh, I want to uh, to get a little help from our student science writer. I'd like to introduce her, Mary Magnuson. There's Mary. Uh, she's our, our Hi, student science writer in university communications and a soon to be graduate with degrees in conservation biology and life sciences communication. So Mary's going to help share some of the questions we got from Michelle. Mary, do you want to kick it off with one of those? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for that talk, Michelle. That was super interesting. Uh, to start off, our first question is, some conservation news can be pretty difficult to grapple with. Do you think that the way journalists and science communicators talk about these issues contributes to a kind of defeatism or trouble getting motivated? And how might we confront this? Yeah, great question. Um, and it's something I think a lot about. And as I mentioned, part of my motivation was right with, for, with right for writing the book was to was to try to get beyond this, you know, depending on extinction as a news peg, which I think, you know, with all the caveats that every extinction really is important and and it's news that we need to cover. It's a bit lazy, I think, for us to f always find the drama in extinction. And, and some of the stories about conservation actually getting done, you know, what community led conservationists are doing all over the world. They may not be as sexy or as as fast moving as as extinction, but once you look below the surface, you know they're full of dramatic human stories and and dramatic stories about animals. And I think that we just we need to challenge ourselves as as journalists who write about these issues to look a little deeper for the drama. Um, I you know as a journalist, I know you you know I'm not I'm not going to suggest that anyone write a boring story out of a sense of duty, but I think there are really interesting stories and we just need to dig below the surface um, and, and find them because writing this book did persuade me that they're there. There's a lot of them out there. And some of them are about success, which I think is really important. It, it, stories about extinction are important to cover and, and I don't I don't want anyone to be minimizing the the threats. Uh, I don't you know mean to imply that everyone you know we should put like a undeserved happy face on what's going on, but we do I think need to show examples of things that are working. And when we tell stories about extinction, it's th that's important to increase awareness of the problem. But but so few of them, when species are very endangered, there there are not very many ways for people to act. Uh, but for people who are fired up by those stories to act on behalf of those species. So I think it can be, you know, and if you read a dozen of those and, and realize that hmm, there's not much I can do other than the obvious of, you know, sending checks to the right places and so forth, it can be demoralizing for the reader. I know it, I know it is for me sometimes as a media consumer, <laughs> since I am a media consumer as well as a producer, but thanks. All right, I've, I've got a question about something people definitely get fired up with about uh, our uh, relationships with predator animals. Get ah. to the, uh, very political issues. Uh, do you know of anyone who's having success cutting through that external political baggage to to get diverse groups of people to engage in conservation projects around animals that may feel like competition even to, to humans in many cases. Yeah, man, and I know it's in the news in Wisconsin in a big way right now. Um, 
I have written a lot about, I have not written about wolf recovery in the Midwest very much at all, but I have written about uh, wolf recovery in the Rockies. And then a couple of years ago, I traveled to Norway where they have an, uh, an eerily similar uh, political landscape surrounding a um, spontaneous is not the right word, but the, the wolves came back by themselves because uh, they had been eradicated 70, 75 years earlier. And then in the eighties, they started uh, returning just, on their own uh, because they were no longer being shot and persecuted. And, and the, the political breakdown of the, the atti public attitudes toward wolves is just so similar to what you find, I think in the upper Midwest and, and in the Rockies and the, I mean, it's tough, you know, those attitudes are, are deep. Um, and the, and a lot of, there's a lot of fear involved, which I think is one of the hardest things to tackle. Um, and then, you know, in recent years, it's all been, it's all of those emotions, those deep emotions and, and inclinations have been amped up by social media. Um, but one of the, it's a, it sounds like a small thing, but it, it did, um, it did seem to have really concrete applications elsewhere. One of the biologists I talked to in Norway said that when he was working on predators, not necessarily wolves, but, but um, I think the, the, the most dramatic example had been with, with lynx and he was hoping to try it with wolves was that when he went to local people and got them involved in in a kind of citizen science where they were deciding where to set the, the there there's a survey taken every year of of wolf numbers in Norway and of predator numbers in Norway and and those numbers uh, are are treated with a lot of suspicion by both sides. People think they're either too big or too small and and so he said, well, how about you know you you know the area really well. Many of these people are hunters or sheep herders and said, how about you help me um, set the cameras in places where you know there are going to be animals and maybe we'll get a more accurate count. And he said that participation, you know, just the participation in collecting the data uh, really cut through that suspicion, the kind of denialism about the data. And then that gave them a, a common set of facts to work with. Okay, we know how many, well, we know how many links there are in this case. Now we can have a conversation. So it didn't solve the problem, but it got through that really intractable, like we're we exist in different <laughs> we exist in different realities, and I think it made it possible on that local level to start having that, to start um, talking about more substantive things. Awesome. Um, kind of along that line, politically, I was wondering if you think that there's a way for us to return to the kind of nonpartisanship that really defined the start of some of the conservation and environmental movements of the 1970s? Whew, I would love to see it. Um, great question. And I, I mean, I think it's really important to remember that not too long ago, you know, within uh, living memory, conservation was not a very political issue. I mean, it, it's much cited, but worth repeating that Richard Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act. Richard Nixon created the EPA. Um, we have Richard Nixon to thank for a lot in the conservation world. And um, as I said, you know, as I said at the end of my talk, I think if you were able to give people a truth serum and say, do you really want that species to go extinct? They, people generally want the animals they live beside, the plants they live beside, their, their own landscapes. They want them to be healthy and they want them to exist beyond them. You know, they want them to be there for their kids and their grandkids. And I, but I don't know how we cut through our, you know, the very warped um, sources of information or quote unquote information that many people have. And, um, and then the, the partisanship, which has, you know, of course goes far beyond conservation. Um, I think people are, are in many ways, you know, more attached to their so-called home team, you know, their political party than they are to even in some cases to their home landscapes. So, uh, I don't have any solution to that other than to say that I think that below all that noise, below all that nonsense, I think the the desire to see other kinds of life survive remains, but it's hard. It's getting buried pretty deep. Well, we, <clears throat> we have an audience member, Jason, with a, a question along uh, similar lines. Uh, he thanks you first, Michelle, for your talk and uh, wants to know what individual citizens can do to encourage their governments 
to prioritize conservation, what is, what isn't helpful, and uh, how we can break through the frame of climate denial common to certain media outlets. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Great questions. Um, let me let me think about how to answer them helpful helpfully. Um, what isn't helpful? Um, let me take that one first. Uh, as far as what individual citizens can do, I think what isn't helpful is to is to be um, a fundamentalist or to have or to have a, a global opinion <laughs> that a certain thing is is the answer everywhere or the answer nowhere. Um, I think conservation needs to happen on many levels, many scales, um, not only landscape scales, but societal scales. And and what works in one place may well not work in another. I mean, we see this uh, with the debate over trophy hunting. You know, it's a third rail for many, many people who call themselves conservationists who are conservationists. Um, and but if you spend any time with conservationists in Africa, they'll tell you that, yes, you know, some some systems of trophy hunting are, you know, are are just opportunities for corruption and opportunities for for real, you know, immoral damage to to animals. But but there are cases, as as I saw in Namibia, there are cases where trophy hunting is used um, in a way. It's I I came to think of it as a way of of ex when it's used very carefully, it can be a way of exploiting colonial nostalgia to protect the lives of the formerly colonized. And I saw some very powerful examples of that. And so, which is not to, I mean, that's, that's a particularly uh, inflammatory issue, but I think it, the lesson that I learned there is applicable to so many other issues. Always, you know, always look for the complexity in the situation as Eleanor Ostrom would remind us and, and, and don't be a fundamentalist in the solutions that you think are, are, uh, the, the solutions you think are warranted, especially when you're not on when you're when you're uh, forming your opinions from far away. <laughs> so let me um, let me move on maybe to the last question. Then if there's time, I can return to those other yeah, two. We'll do one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our last question is, what do you think that people who are traditionally trained in conservation biology should know about storytelling or about cultural understandings of conservation? Mm, thank you for asking that. I. Um, I am a. I was trained in conservation biology, and uh, I was. I am a big admirer of what the field has accomplished. I write about um, Michael Soule, who was one of the founders of the field, who was actually my neighbor in Colorado for many years. Um, and I, it has done so much, as I said in, at the end of my talk, to identify what species need. Um, but it's done less to. Uh, to help humans understand how they can provide what species need. And, and in that way, I think um, conservation, this, I know the Society for Conservation Biology is, is, has always included some social scientists and is doing, is, and is working to include more and to integrate them more into the work of conservation biology. So I just think, uh, I mean, there's a lot to say here and I won't go into it, but just very broadly, um, understanding that social science has so much to teach us as conservationists that conservation biology is is as i said just part of the puzzle and and that uh that social scientists can be equal and valuable partners in the work of conservation because you know conservation is a human enterprise and it requires changing human behavior uh so i think that that is a really important part of the conservation movement going forward, especially in a part of the research supporting conservation going forward. All right. We really appreciate your time, Michelle. It was a very interesting talk and uh, your, your perspective on this stuff after so long reporting on it for books and uh, great magazine pieces is, is, I think, helpful to everybody, especially the, the people who may have to communicate on these issues <laughs> from, uh, from campus going forward. So thanks again for, for joining us, and thanks to everybody who watched. Uh, I had a good time. I hope you did, too. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Chris. And, and thanks to all of you for having me for a virtual visit this semester. Oh yeah, we got to get you here in real life. Uh, it's been a while since I, I was pre pandemic My last visit to Leopold Country was uh, at the end of 2019, so just pre pandemic. So I'd like to get back yeah, to Madison good. and surroundings. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everyone. Yeah.
You too. Bye.